Hey everyone, so let's go ahead and talk about the argument research essay that you were introduced to and you have the assignment guidelines but sometimes those can be a little technical to follow along with and really get the details of the essay. So this PowerPoint is going to break apart each required section of the argument research essay. Use this PowerPoint as a guide for when you draft the essay just to make sure you're keeping on track with everything. So as we've been discussing, argument research essays, they're very formal. And why is that? Because arguments can be complex if topics are difficult, meaning complex topics. And why is that? Why are they difficult? Because challenging someone's mind is a difficult, changing someone's mind is a difficult challenge. Why is that? Because morals, ethics, values, and general upbringings are deeply rooted in an individual's mind. Of course, we change as we get older. We have new experiences. It doesn't mean we stay the same person as we are from day one. But regardless, we adapt and our minds are pretty concrete with how we feel about something, especially if it's, like I said, a complex topic as well. So because of that, you want to respect others by hearing their point of view, their side to an argument. And that can be challenging, especially if it's something that you are extremely passionate about. It can be difficult to remove yourself from the discussion and hear other alternative perspectives than your own. But if your goal is to change their minds, you aren't really listening. You're not listening to what your audience has to say. So it's not an effective argument. It's not an effective discussion. So that's why the goal of this argument research essay is not, I'll zoom in all dramatic, is not, <laughs> I'm having fun recording on my phone. <laughs> the goal of this essay is not to change the audience's mind. The goal is to reach common ground. So let's talk about that a little bit more. How do you reach common ground? Because your credibility, your ethos, right, must be considered, a specific structure to your argument must be followed because you want to be taken serious and you also just want to make sure your message is being clear and sent across in a clear way. So your essays are using the Rogerian style of argumentation. You've been introduced to that as well. Uh, to organize everything that you want to talk about. And you're accomplishing the following. A formal structure to argument. Finding credible sources to validate what you're discussing. Your respect to others by also taking a little bit of time to validate and write the alternative perspectives that are different to your own argument. Thus leading to reaching that common ground. So talking about the Rogerian style of argument, your essay will apply the following order to make sure you're following that Rogerian style of argumentation, where you have an introduction paragraph, you have an acknowledgement to the opposing side, that's at least two paragraphs, your actual argument, at least three paragraphs, the middle ground, at least one paragraph, and of course the conclusion, one paragraph. So we'll discuss each of these in more detail, but if you notice, your argument gets pushed more towards the center of the paper instead of starting with it and just talking about your own argument and that's it. Instead, you push it back a little bit because you stop and you give respect to alternative perspectives about this topic first. Because again, it's just that level of formality and respect in tone. So let's discuss each of these required sections in more detail. The introduction should be one paragraph. Don't spend too much time on the introduction. It's not a summary paper about your topic, so you don't want too much in the introduction. Of course, remember one paragraph is at least five sentences or more. That's a developed paragraph. It should include the following. What is your actual topic? What is your argument topic? Provide very, very brief background summary so the topic is clear. Continuing summary writing here and just what we call contextualizing background information. You also need that famous thesis statement that we discuss, but as you've realized, each genre of essay, the thesis is very different. So once again, the thesis statement in this essay, in the argument research essay, is very different. Um, it doesn't state your argument. 
it doesn't state your point of view. It discusses how different perspectives can come to an agreement with this topic. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is I'm going to use a sample topic to apply the guidelines so that it hopefully gives you a little bit more clarity. Since we all talked about that argument against the syllabus a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to use that as a sample. Of course, this is not your topic for the argument research essay, but you're pretty familiar with it since you had to discuss it already. So if your topic was about the argument against the syllabus, in your introduction paragraph, you would first explain what a syllabus is. Maybe people don't know, right? So you want to explain what, that it's a, it's a formal document used for college classes. Then you share what the argument is about. That some think it's an official document for classes to follow, and others feel it puts more stress on everyone than it needs to. So you introduce what this argument is behind that. What is the syllabus and why are people arguing about it? Last, close on that thesis that states, and remember thesis statements are one sentence, two at most, that states how these two viewpoints can come to an agreement. So a sample thesis for this essay could be a way for these perspectives to reach common ground. Use that word common ground in your thesis because that's the goal of the paper anyways. Reach common ground is to have a simpler syllabus that lists goals students will accomplish in the class and not put pressure on attendance policies. That's something I came up with for common ground. The cool thing about middle ground and common ground in general is it's your own opinion on how you can bridge these alternative perspectives to the argument together. So if, I, if people are arguing that the syllabus is important and it's official, but others feel it's too much stress, maybe my thesis would be this to reach common ground. So that's what you do in the introduction. Your thesis might be written last. Don't put it last, put it in the introduction. But the more seasoned you get with writing, you'll find that thesis statements, because the paper changes so much, because it truly depends on what your sources are saying for this type of essay, that your thesis might be the last thing you write down in the and you go in the introduction and put it back in there because papers change with research. So that's the introduction paragraph. Now let's move on to the next required section. That is the acknowledgement to the opposing side. That is such an important section that you don't want to miss. Before you get into your own argument, you need to gain cred credibility by writing about alternative perspectives first. Remember that alternative perspectives just mean those who have different arguments than what you're writing about. This acknowledgement to the opposing side should be at least two paragraphs. So you spend quite a little bit of time validating the alternative perspective or perspectives. It should be the following. What are the opposite viewpoints against your own argument? Depending on the topics, you can just focus on one alternative viewpoint or perspective rather, or you can discuss more than one. That's entirely up to you. Regardless, write about at least one alternative perspective that's different than your own argument. So that way the audience can picture this little debate between the topic. Very important here, You and I'll do my dramatic zoom. I'm so sorry if you get queasy though, I hope you're not with my zooming. Use at least one source here to validate that opposing side because you want to understand this opposing side and validate it even though you don't agree with it. And that can be very challenging if you have a serious topic, but you have to place yourself out of the equation and try to validate the other perspective. Very important for this essay in general do not write about your personal experiences in this essay. You're using credible sources to validate the viewpoints. So let's think about my example about the syllabus. If my argument was against the syllabus, what I would write about in this section, in the acknowledgement section, is why the syllabus is an important document. If I'm arguing that it's not a good thing, I have to take that opinion out for a second. I have to write two paragraphs about why the syllabus is important. I'd then find a source to prove why it's important. Maybe I found a source that conducted research on two classes. One class that had a syllabus, one without. 
did some research, the person who published the article did the research and found that students were more successful in the class with the syllabus. That's enough reasons to validate that it could be useful. I may not agree with it personally, right? In this, in this rhetorical situation, of course, that I'm writing about, but that is my way of validating that. You know what? These perspectives, they have a valid point. It is important and it is helpful to keep students on track in a way. So that would be maybe what I write about. Now, no, this is just an example. I don't know if there's research out there about this. Um, this is just to help explain this section to you all. This also isn't my own personal opinion, by the way, with the syllabus. There's good and bad to everything. So that's what you're doing in the acknowledgement to the opposing side. Make sure it's at least two paragraphs and make sure you find one source that validates. Next, you lead to your argument. Now it's what you've been waiting for. This section will discuss your own perspective, your own opinion, your own argument. I'll say your own argument and be at least three paragraphs so you have some time to write about it. It should cover the following. What is your viewpoint to this topic? It should be a different viewpoint than this acknowledgement. Be formal here. Don't use words such as I'm right, the previous section, the other side is dumb and wrong. Obviously, this is the only answer. That sounds very immature, right? It sounds like you don't care what the others have to say. And it gives you, it sounds like you have that tunnel vision where you're only thinking about your own perspective. Tempting to be that way, right? But we can't. You also want to write this in third person point of view only. As tempting as it is, I know that I'm saying, what is your viewpoint? So you're tempted to say my opinion, right? But you're taking yourself out of this whole discussion. Yes, you have strong connections to this argument that you're writing about maybe. As tempting as it is though, avoid first and second person. Why? Isn't it my argument? That's not fair, you're thinking maybe. Yes, but you want a formal tone. And you also are not relying on personal experiences anyways. You're relying on research. So you're using those research, the research to validate this perspective, this argument. Defend this argument by using at least three sources. So at least three, it's a lot in this section. So you're only relying on those sources to validate this argument. So let's think about my example again. If my argument is in favor of removing the syllabi from courses, this section is where I'd write about why that's necessary, why it's necessary to remove the syllabus. Maybe I'd say it's less stress on students, instructors don't feel obligated to follow strict calendars, more room for creativity, etc. As tempting as it is, because I'm an instructor and I've been a student, I can write about personal experiences, but I will not do that. I can't write about my own experiences. I'm taking myself, my experiences out and using credible, unbiased sources. I would take myself out of the discussion and validate my argument with sources to prove why it's less stress, why instructors would have more room to improvise and be creative, et cetera, whatever I would come up with if this was my essay, and then of course find sources to prove those reasons. So that's your argument section. Middle ground. Now that you've presented your topic, discussed alternative perspectives, and discussed your own argument, you then lead the audience to your thesis, actually, the middle ground, uh, how everyone can reach a common ground with this topic. The middle ground should be at least one paragraph and it discusses the following. First, what is valid about the alternative perspectives? When you wrote about this part, acknowledgement to the opposing sides, summarize that in a few words and state why this is a valid perspective. Even though, again, you don't agree to it, why is it valid? Then think about what you wrote about in your argument. Summarize that in maybe a few sentences or two. And valid, what is valid about this opinion, this argument? Then close on this. What is the future outlook with your topic? What that means is how can all these perspectives that you just presented come to an agreement? What do you suggest they do moving forward in the future? No sources in this section, the middle ground. Why? Because this is your own discussion. 
on how the future could be for the middle ground. I like the middle ground section because there's a, there's a YouTuber I watch. She presents research. She shares the stories. She doesn't offer her opinion. Then at the very end, the last two minutes of the video, she closes on a middle ground. And it's very formal because it's her way of saying, okay, this is what I think we need to do moving forward. So it's kind of neat that you get to offer suggestions. So you don't need sources here because it's your own suggestions on your own discussion on how the future could be for middle ground. It's almost, think about the discussions we do for our class where you all kind of brainstorm and, and collaborate on ideas based on the topic. You never need, you, would, you don't need sources for those discussions in the past. So this middle ground works the same way. So let's think about my example. If my alternative perspective discussed why the syllabus is important, I'd first write about why that's fair and valid. Then I'd write about why the syllabus is an issue and why that argument is valid. Then I'd discuss the middle ground. Perhaps keep a syllabus in existence, still have it since it's, it is important, but maybe eliminate demanding policies or may, basically what I mean is Clean it up so the document is simple and not overwhelming for students to read. That it still uses required department and school objectives that are required in the syllabus, but also not overwhelming for students. And I would write about all that in a paragraph. So the conclusion to close. Your conclusion should be one paragraph that discusses the following. What is the benefit of this common ground you just wrote about previously? And why is coming to an agreement important? It's kind of that future outlook, closing thoughts, why this matters type of, why this matters type of discussion. So I would talk about why this should be streamlining, not streaming. I was obviously watching a YouTube video when I wrote that. I would talk about why streamlining, cleaning up a syllabus into a simpler document would benefit students from being confused, having to navigate and will also help instructors feel less pressured in constantly adding more to it. It's just me talking about the importance of it. Of course, I would develop that more, make sure it's at least five sentences, your actual conclusion, because it needs to be a developed paragraph. But that's your conclusion. Think about the required format for the essay. Again, you're using that Rogerian style that follows the exact order of the previous slides and the guidelines. At least four sources total of any or a variety of the following. Newspaper articles, magazine articles, books, documentaries, etc. No websites at all unless it's .gov, .org, .edu, or .net. So be careful with that. .com we can work with, but feel free to send me an email to verify. What you want to avoid are blogs because those are very opinion based without, they're not, they don't require research. Anybody can create a blog and share. They're almost like journals in a way, so they're not credible. I have a separate PowerPoint lecture about sources. So if you have any question about source types, feel free to workshop with me or ask me and I can gladly help. Um, make sure to review the previous information, of course, to clarify what sections these sources should go. And what I mean by that is you need four sources at least. Where are those found? You need one in the acknowledgement section and then you need three in the argument section, so four total. APA format, if, uh, you need a title page, an APA format, an abstract. Think about that APA video you reviewed weeks ago. An abstract goes on page two. It's about one paragraph to half a page, no more. That summarizes your entire paper. So when you're done with your paper, you can't write it until you complete the essay. So when you complete the essay, read through it steer away from it and summarize it. You all are getting really more and more comfortable with summarizing information. So remember, summarizing is the main idea. It doesn't focus on details. So focus on what the argument was, the opposing sides, and the, the common ground. Summarize that paragraph or half a page at most. And that's what an abstract does. I tell students, pretend we were in a face-to-face -face class and everybody had to go around and share what their paper was about. And that's what an abstract does. It summarizes the main sections of the paper in a paragraph or half a page. 
in-text citations every time you use a source and a reference page that lists all the sources at the very end after the conclusion. If your paper lacks in-text citations, you will receive a failing grade. If it lacks a reference page, you will receive a failing grade. Why? Because this is a research report, so you have to use sources as part of the, quote, conventions of the genre. That's what's expected. Like a narrative essay has the conventions of descriptive detail about setting. Um, a research report requires in-text citations and reference pages because you don't want to plagiarize, right? If you don't have any in-text citations or a reference, then you are not giving credit. So that's a failing grade. So just be careful with that. Feel free to workshop with me if you need APA assistance. Required format, the usual 700 words or more. That doesn't include the title page on page one, the abstract on page two, or the reference page at the very end of the report. Double-spaced, one-inch margins, completed on Word or Google Docs. It's typical 12-point font, Times New Roman, or a similar style. Make sure you're writing in third-person point of view, even though it's, it's, it's your argument. Uh, incorrect. I believe the syllabus is a stressful document for students. My argument is valid because I found research that proves this. That's in first person because it's using words like I and my. Uh, this is also incorrect. I believe the syllabus is stressful because you feel a lot of stress when you have to read it. This is in first and second person. The word I and the word you, try to avoid you as well because that's second person. Correct way to do this. The syllabus is a demanding document for students. Research validates that stress in that stress levels increase when students read through the document. The word students is third person. So if you have questions about that, let me know. Common concern when writing a research paper. Am I relying too much on my sources? Am I relying too little on my sources? Am I plagiarizing? First note that this is what you should cite. Any kind of theory coined by an author. Research, whenever a source mentions a study, it's great information to use in your paper and must be cited. Studies, similar to research, it must be cited. Ideas the author of the source has, make sure they are credible, of course, when they share their opinions. You know, is it based on a theory? Is it based on research that they conducted? Ideologies. Information you conduct for if you're interested in primary. Primary research is not required. So, I, again, I have a separate PowerPoint about types of sources where I discuss primary research in a little more detail. But if you interviewed or surveyed people in relation to your topic, that counts. So uh, make sure you cite it. You don't want to plagiarize as silly as it sounds yourself. But again, primary research is not required. <laughs> what you don't need to cite. Common knowledge. More than a billion sources to discuss it. You don't need to cite it. For example, the sky is blue. Broccoli is a vegetable. Thursdays before Friday, etc. History. If it's a real event that doesn't discuss data, research, or theory, it doesn't need to be cited. For example, the year, the location of a place, or when an event occurred. When you should cite is if you found specific statistical numbers with that information, because that means people conducted research to find out that number, to get that number. For example, when they collect census data on population information, that would need to be cited. Let me know if you have citation questions. And if you have any questions, I'm looking forward to these essays, y'all, and I hope you have a great time writing them.